thanks and welcome to Dr. Umar Shankar Pandey as the speaker of this today's webinar. And I also welcome Dr. Sunil Kath Bhaira, who is the advisor of uh, this webinar series and professor of eminence Tajpur University. So right now we have 49 50 participants we have and we expect that other participants will join. Those of you who will face any problem over here, they can join the uh, live Facebook and uh, the live uh, YouTube page of IMS Odisha. So friends, we are very happy to welcome Dr. Uma Sankar Pandey. Presently, he is an associate of the uh, professor and head of the Department of Journalism, Mass Communication, Surendranath College for Women, University of Kolkata. Uh, since September 2002, Dr. Pandey is working as the uh, associate professor and he completed his master's and PhD in journalism and mass communication from the University of Kolkata. He is the first India ambassador of the International Association for Media and Communication. Dr. Pandey is a member of the Board of Studies at a number of Indian universities before joining academics. He was a senior journalist with English National Delhi, the Asian Age, Kolkata. Also an editorial board member of a number of international journals. He has published over 20 papers uh, in rep uh, referred to journals, has authored four books. So uh, number of things I have to say about uh, Dr. Pandey. And uh, he has so many things to tell, but uh, I can tell at least Dr. Umar Shankar Pandey is a known face across the country in the media education world. We are very happy. Since the last so many days, I am personally I am watching Dr. Pandey is speaking about the data journalism. And uh, one point of time, I thought perhaps Dr. Pandey is the authority to speak on the data journalism. Particularly, uh, I can say whenever I heard his talk on the data journalism, Somehow or other it influenced me. And uh, when we planned the topics and the issues for the third open city, we thought, let us have a topic on the data journalism and let us hear from Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey. And we are very fortunate. Uh, Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey is with us today. And I hope his entire discussion will have a uh, brief idea about uh, the data journalism, particularly it will help to our young media educators and uh, research scholars and the students at large, those who are pursuing journalism and mass communication course. With these words, I welcome Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey to the third day of the third series of webinar organized by Institute of Media Studies, Dukkala University, Bhavanesha. So uh, uh, Dr. Pandey, I welcome you. Again, I extend my heartfelt welcome to all the participants and my colleagues and the host and the students who have joined with us in this today's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Now I request you to continue your discussion. Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pardee, for this opportunity. And it's a privilege for me to be associated with this webinar series. Uh, my guru, uh, Professor Behra, is one of the advisors. And uh, I'm very privileged that you know uh, he gave me this opportunity. And, I've seen your passion for journalism education for so many years, and it's really something very, very uh, praiseworthy. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we've had, you know, some international friends who will be joining us also on this thing. So I will keep it only in English uh, for, for the benefit of uh, everybody. If there is any question or anything, just you can put it on the chat box or you can uh, raise your hands and the host will allow you to ask. So as we go along, I'll keep it less academic and uh, more for practitioners because uh, Data journalism is a very, very important issue that uh, uh, we should uh, know about, especially in the present uh, digital ecosystem. And I'll explain why it is important as well. Now, I'll start off with, uh, you know, a very uh, important discussion on journalism itself. Now, this is from a book, Apostles of Certainty, which came out from Oxford University Press by C.W. Anderson uh, just uh, uh, last year. Now, uh, it, it talks about, you know, two very important things about journalism. It says uh, journalism 
makes two different kinds of claims. First of all, it's it's a very modest thing that it has to report the news of the day fairly quickly. I mean, that's a very uh, modest kind of work it does. The second thing it claims is that it possesses the methodological techniques that allows it to objectively parse social reality. That means it has the right tools to find out what is the social reality. And that is where the uh, challenge for journalism lies. That What are these tools and how does it make people believe what it says is true? And that's a very important uh, distinction that we'll have to uh, you know, understand as we go along. The first form that uh, scholars are you know, kind of uh, unanimous about is the narrative journalism, which was a structure that allowed people to see what is, what is true uh, through you know, uh, this, this featureish form that we all know about, you know, uh, lit, uh, you know uh, tools of literary fiction and all that where there is a short story structure and there's a character, there's a problem, there's a resolution. And that is how journalism or journalists, they take what they consider to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, true facts, if I can use that word, to everybody else uh, uh, across, uh, you know, uh, to the uh, uh, audience and to the consumers and everybody. The problem with narrative journalism is that a lot of the uh, claims that you are making, you do not provide an evidence for that. I'll just, uh, uh, you know, very quickly uh, discuss a very short uh, incident which happened way back in 1980 in the Washington Post where uh, Janet Cook, a writer, she won a, a Pulitzer Prize for her, uh, you know, featureish explanation of a 13-year-old heroin addict, Jimmy. And she won the Pulitzer Prize in 1981. Now, this Pulitzer Prize, you know, was, was kind of an unfortunate event for her because uh, very soon people wanted to find out who's that Jimmy and what, what, is, what is his, uh, you know, uh, case now and what is his situation now. Very soon it was found out that uh, Jimmy did not even exist. So the problem of the narrative journalism that I just spoke of is that many a times journalists avoid fact checking so that they don't want to ruin a very good story. So if there's a good story, don't let facts come in the way. And that is one problem with uh, uh, journalism as such, which has stayed because we do not often provide uh, the right evidence to our readers or uh, we do not uh, allow them to verify, you know, what is true. Now, journalism has other techniques also like, uh, you know, putting in quotes and, you know, showing videos, etc. to uh, kind of uh, establish their truth claims. Now, the watershed year was in 1973 when uh, Philip Mayer published his Precision Journalism uh, book. Now, here he was talking about things which were radically different from uh, journalism or new journalism that existed till that particular time. He spoke of adopting scientific methods, basically, you know, statistical tools to uh, uh, send across the message to everybody else or, or to, you know, use uh, allowing journalists to use the statistical tools to establish whatever they were claiming in many senses this precision journalism thing this precision journalism book is regarded as one of the uh, first uh, attempts at uh, you know uh, data journalism or numerical journalism or even computer assisted reporting so that's the watershed here a lot of the questions that these precision journalists ask is very relevant for data as well because very soon we will realize data journalism is more of journalism and less of data. All the things that we talk about uh, journalistic sources are applicable to data as well. Uh, as I go along, I'll try and explain you know what I mean by all this. Now, this is the question that uh, Philip Mayer and uh, his band of precision journalists uh, intended to answer: how to find information, how to evaluate and analyze it, how to present it in a manner that with the information overload, mind you, this is what they spoke of in 1973. And this is still very valid. In 73 as well, they had this information overload. Now, in the digital era, I'll just talk about, you know, how much information overload we are facing. And then amount of precision needing for a, uh, needed for a particular story. Every story does not need the exact amount of precision. This is the background of, uh, you know, kind of uh, data journalism uh, as it were. Now, at present, there are estimates, there are guesstimates that we are facing about 40 zettabytes of data in the world at present. One zettabyte, uh, if I have to explain in uh, our terms, would be 100 crore terabytes. 
that is the amount of digital data that is present in the uh, ecosystem or if i have to you know put it in uh, simple terms if all these data that is available in the world if it were to be you know put on uh, dvds then we'll have stacks of dvds that will be long enough to circle earth 50 times so the amount of uh, digital information available to us is astounding and i'm sure as journalists everybody you know uh, this is also for practitioners as i keep on saying because uh, there are three or four levels at which uh, data journalism has to be addressed and i'll try and explain uh, one or two of these levels now this is important that a journalist is as good as his sources we know and uh, journalists would you know keep their sources with always happy so that you know these were the sources who had access to information who had access to ministers who had access to statisticians etc and they would be the ones telling the story to the journalists and journalists would you know in, in turn uh, take it out to, uh, uh, present it to their readers in a format which was uh, 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 you know uh, which 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 had uh, the uh, journalistic product uh, format i'll talk about what we mean by journalistic product now with this amount of data the amount of sources that is available to everybody is astounding as i say the amount of source that we have is, is uh, so much that uh, you know we can uh, conceivably ask almost everything out of the data and we can get the information out of the data which would be good for uh, journalistic stories so all the applications of journalism basically we talk about the three c's your criticality whether you are being able to ask the critical uh, questions or not your uh, uh, creativity whether you know you're asking uh, those uh, questions uh, creatively or not so uh, these these are the things that uh, gen journalists generally have to do it has to also uh, do it for the data sources that are available so here when we are talking of data journalism we are talking in two different terms we are talking of data as source and we are talking of data as tools and just the same amount of uh, discretion that we would avoid, the same amount of uh, journalistic practice that we would avoid, uh, uh, you know, abide by, we have to abide with the uh, digital data as well. Now, uh, the problem is that there is so much of information that making, uh, uh, you know, uh, sense of all that information is one of the major challenges that uh, all of us have to face uh, on, on, on a regular basis. When information was scarce, you know, uh, our job as journalists was to hunt down that information, to gather that information. Now that information is abundant. Our job as journalists now, or as communicators, or mass communicators now, is to bring sense and structure out of this never-ending flow of data, so that, uh, you know, the meaning of the news becomes more important. Because the raw information is not enough, we have to make sense of the information for everybody concerned. So the main focus shifts from being the fastest to report the story. So your job no longer is to being the fastest to uh, report stories, but you have to explain what it actually means. What, uh, what signal to draw from the noise, because when, when you have an information overload, there's a problem of noise. So picking out the uh, signal out of that, those uh, noise is the job of the a journalist is the job of the communicator so with uh, data we have to actually explain what a certain development actually means we will uh, just talk about how to access those data and how to explain and all but the uh, we are just setting uh, the the stage for uh, what how to use the data that uh, we're going to talk about now uh, i'll have to talk about two or three pitfalls before we start because uh, we should not assume data to be you know just like uh, without any uh, uh, bias or we, we should not assume data to be uh, we cannot take it at, at face value so it's important that we understand two or three pitfalls there are there are huge indicators of that i'm just you know touching the surface of many of these it's just that uh, uh, if you want to prove anything you will find some data to prove whatever you're trying to prove but that would not be journalism because when we're talking of journalism basically we have to uh, keep two things in mind one is the journalistic ethics that uh, is is so much a part of our profession and uh, second is about uh, uh, you know asking the right questions for public interest. If it is not in public interest, then it is not journalism. Then it is something else. So uh, there's so much data, as I said. Uh, I will also you know talk about the distinction between small data and big data and try and understand what it means. Because uh, at this level, we are just talking about small data, and I'll be talking about those uh, DIY do-it-yourself. Uh, 
projects that uh, all uh, you know all students can do for themselves. So it's, this is not about big data. I'll explain what big data means, but uh, data journalism is not just about big data. That I want to emphasize because uh, if we talk about you know coding or uh, accessing data at, at that level right at the beginning, then probably it's not. Then we are probably not doing the right thing. So data journalism would add little value if we are not open-minded. It's objective as long as you want to make it objective, not just because it's based on numbers. That's why everything is right about it. Data journalism is as good as the questions you ask. It. Another very pitfall is related to the field of economics. It's, this is very very important, and we have to understand that you know uh, well, even even in political discourse, uh, you know, data being thrown from one end to the other, you know, and probably both the data is correct, but uh, you know, uh, we have to. Uh, Kind of sift through, filter through uh, all, all, all these, uh, uh, you know, contestations of, of uh, how people are measuring the data. Goodhart law says that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be good measure. So, for example, you know, when we have uh, the significance measures in statistics that we talk about, if that is the only target that you know by hook or by crook you have to reach up to 0 0.05 level of significance and your work is done, then probably it is not a good measure. And we know the problems of the p value in statistics all of us so uh, this is something that you have to be very careful about when people say that you know we have achieved this or we have achieved that or this is where we have reached so on and so forth then probably that it is not a good measure whether you are able to ask the right questions from that particular data so these are three very important questions before we uh, get into uh, uh, you know uh, extracting data and analyzing it these are three very important questions that we have to ask ourselves how was the data sourced? Who is responsible for it? What were the methods? Who paid for it? And what does it want to find out? Is that data new? Is it old? Is it historical? Or uh, what are the units? Or what are they comparing? So on and so forth. So how was the data sourced? Is a very important question that we have to ask about the data. How was it analyzed? Most often, when uh, people are writing stories about the data, we just ask about you know uh, we we have it on a platter. Maybe the analysis has been done by other people. We just know the, uh, you know, answers provided by uh, people who have analyzed it, and we just send it to our readers and consumers and viewers, etc. So, how was it analyzed is a very important question that we have to ask. Uh, the third is, what is it that the data doesn't tell us? What is it that is that the data is trying to hide? What is it that uh, we have to ask the data? So uh, if we know the right questions to ask the data, then we are, uh, we are on the right path. We have to write a story at the end of the day. Our job is not to impress people with, with, with uh, statistical wizardry or you know, just to bombard people with numbers so that you know, uh, they don't uh, get to see the real picture there. So the objective of data journalists is to attract readers so they can see through the headline figure. First of all, you have to start off with that headline figure that people take notice. I'm not talking of clickbait, but the real information that people uh, uh, sit up and take notice. Oh my God, this is, what is it? So we should know more about it. Everybody should be able to read the story without having to know that it comes from a data set. So the numbers are just your tools very often, or they're just the sources. And you don't even have to know name your sources. Just like in regular journalism, we don't always name our sources. So if uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, writing the data story, we have to make it very important that it is exciting and it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, interesting for the reader because if it is not exciting and interesting for the reader, then your job as a communicator is not being, uh, you know, uh, fulfilled. Your job is to uh, put up the story in a manner in which people find that interesting. Now, there are some wonderful books uh, that uh, the data journalism, you know, has been uh, providing us over the last uh, few years. So these are some of the books that we follow regularly. The one on the left, which you see finding stories with spreadsheets, that's a very important resource because just, uh, we, you know, we will uh, talk about this in a moment that with uh, Excel sheets, you know, we can provide uh, a lot, lot of information. But your journalistic nose for a story is, is, is very important. Because if the journalistic uh, nose for the story is not there, then probably you are, uh, uh, you know, missing out on uh, on important information. As I said, the three C's: the curiosity. If you do not have 
curiosity about you know what information that I should seek so that I can provide my readers, then you are not doing a good job. And as I said, creativity, you know, creativity in, in finding out the questions, creativity in presenting the answers. And uh, thirdly, the critical questioning. So these three C's are important for every journalist. It is even more important for a data journalist. Being creative, uh, uh, you know, being curious and having that criticality. So these are very important books and uh, I'm sharing books which, uh, which are uh, in my domain or which, which I have with me. So just, just to show you, uh, just to establish that these are very, uh, there, is a, there is a lot of, you know, this happening all over the world. The one you see in the middle is uh, one of the first books. Uh, many of the things that we're talking here is, is, is uh, from this uh, data journalism handbook that exists. The one on the left, uh, you, it talks about pivot tables. I'll talk about that as well. On the right is about uh, web scraping, etc. So these are the tools that we'll be uh, using generally. Uh, now, you know, I'll try and get into uh, the brass tacks of, uh, uh, you know, how to extract data and how to analyze it and how to find stories, etc. Now, as I said, data can be the source of the news stories or it can be a tool with which the uh, news story is told. But we have to give this uh, caveat always that like any other journalistic source, the data should be treated with skepticism. You cannot take that at face value. Also, this is just like journalism. Like journalists, they sniff out, report and relate stories for a living. We are doing the same thing. And I keep on saying that it's just like, you know, uh, almost like photojournalism. It's just that, you know, instead of a camera, we are, you know, changing it for a laptop. So it's, it's a different from the word journalism, like, uh, you know, the word journalism is about, he said, he added journalism that we uh, jokingly say. So it's, it's much more different from that. Here we have to talk about facts, we have to talk about evidence, and we have to talk about uh, other stories as well. Data requests should begin with a list of questions you want to answer. Data is often messy, it needs to be cleaned. Every data scientist will tell you it takes about almost 70% of your time to clean the data. And data may have many undocumented features and you'll have to make sense of that. The difference between big data and small data, I have to put it in very, very simplistic terms. Big data is uh, so much data that you know maybe two, three or four computers are not uh, good enough to handle that. Or you know the amount of information there is huge so uh, the most that one computer these days has is about one terabyte of hard disk so uh, big data is something uh, much more than that but the good news is that even the biggest journalism stories is uh, not about you know big data it is about small data i'm sure everybody's heard about panama papers and the stories about that where uh, we had about uh, 400 journalists from 100 uh, institutions all over the world you know trying to extract information from data the Panama Papers, the uh, entire uh, data involved in that Panama Paper was 2.4 terabytes. So that is uh, not much. And they could get 5,000 stories out of those Panama Papers and uh, it had the worldwide reputation. So when we are talking about data, we are basically are talking about small data, data that you can uh, extract on your spreadsheet, data that you can extract on your Excel sheets, and you can ask questions of those data. So first of all, very important to know the Google search format. The simplest format that we tell students or we tell practitioners is to append the file type. File type colon XLS or file type colon CSV with your search term. So suppose you, you are trying to find out education in Odisha. Then if you have to add a file type colon XLS with the uh, search on, on, on the Google search bar so that you get the exact uh, XLS sheet because if it is on XLS format or on CSV format, it will be easier for you to uh, make sense out of it. Uh, it's important uh, uh, as, as a first part to realize that you know we can uh, Google search about any particular thing. The second search that I want you to take uh, as a takeaway is the data set search. If you go for data set search on Google, then it will take you to exact uh, you know, data sets about uh, events that you're wanting to find about. Now, before we start this, uh, let me tell you that generally there are three or four major things that we uh, use data journalism for. One is crime, the second is health, and the third is education. So th these are starting points. After that, you know, there are many other things that you can do, but for starters, you can start off with uh, crime-related data, you can start with health-related health. Uh, it itself is, you know, like uh, 
health itself is uh, is there any chat thing there no no sir you continue actually we are not able to make uh, youtube live so i request oh. people if they can go for uh, facebook live oh i see i see is it available okay. on facebook live uh, yes it is in facebook live okay okay, okay. i have it in ims uh, official site thank you okay, okay. okay. then 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 thank you thank you very much so uh, the data set search is one search which provides you with uh, exact uh, you know data sets that you are looking for so instead of looking for uh, the entire uh, google search you can narrow down your search to you can see on the screen it's called the data set search dot research dot google dot com now a lot of the things that you know data journalism books spoke about maybe four or five years ago they are no longer available so all the things that i'm showing you in my presentation they are very much available and uh, you know i've gone through all this uh, uh, you know yesterday and they are all uh, available there are very important places where you can take uh, government data there is this india.gov.in slash data portal india there is nic.in slash project slash open government data there is data.gov for you know a lot of other uh, uh, you know government organizations outside india you can have it for uk you can have it for usa you can have it for uh, anybody and everybody there is a uh, 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 you know thing known as scraper wiki you can use that to extract data about uh, uh, as i said uh, you can start off with crime with education and with health uh, and other things with weather as well so it it can it can provide you with that data we have the world bank and united nations sites uh, the unesco sites and so on and so forth uh, i'll uh, skip this one i'll come back to that later on, uh, later on. we have a lot of these data that you can start working on right right today right after this if you want to there is this uh, uh uh thank you so much sir thank you very much sir the rbi database of indian economy is uh, one database you just have to search it these are links and i have removed the hyperlink but if you want hyperlinks you know i can send those hyperlinks to you as well there is this ministry of statistics and program implementation data set you just have to type all this and you'll get uh, loads and loads of data that you can ask questions from there is this gateway to indian earth observation there is the national portal of india there is survey of india there is indian weather data there is that import exports data set there is the wildlife institute of india data set so these are just examples to suggest that all these data sets exist in the public you don't even have to you know call them they are there and all the stories are there you just have to ask questions of those stories so using these data sets is a very important uh, start to uh, data journalism because data journalism as i said the first uh, distinction is in the manner in which you access information so uh, accessing information either from public data or through uh, government sites or through sites which are reliable so you have to be very careful about you know which site you are uh, downloading it from uh, because if if, you, if it's not reliable data then of course you will not get reliable uh, answers out of it if the data is not structured all this data that i have been talking about these are structured they're structured in rows and columns and we have to you know get used to you know the row and column structure these are questions that we'll have to ask very often and uh, i can safely predict that uh, maybe very very soon data journalism has to be a part of each and every journalism course uh, right from the bachelor's degree to uh, all degrees because that's where you know get you get information from and that's where you can get information from just sitting at your home with no knowing a few statistical tools which are very very easily available now if the data is not structured then you will have to uh, use other means of extracting that data and that includes you know uh, the web scraping methods you can get it from apis every uh, 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 you know the website these days has uh, things called apis application programming interface where they can provide you data that you ask so say for example if you want to ask for data from twitter then you need to have a developer account in twitter they will give you with uh, four keys the secret keys and with that you can ask uh, you know data from twitter with from facebook and from in, in instagram i don't want to uh, uh, you know confuse you right at the beginning but there are you know web scraping tools which go from you know uh, uh, programming uh, programs like beautiful soup to uh, scrapy to uh, many other you know uh, codes which are written on python but as a for, for starters we don't need to even know computer programming to extract or to scrape data from the web there is this uh, app which is known as uh, uh, down them all it's not down the mall it is down them all 
So if you have this down them all, you can get a lot of uh, uh, you know unstructured data also from the internet, and then you know you'll have to uh, clean data and all that, and uh, try and get information. So we have to know where to get data from, where to get reliable data from. So when we uh, get, get this reliable data, we have to you know analyze from that reliable data as well. So uh, it's very important. I'm just trying to. Uh, yeah, uh, all the sites that I spoke to are, are the sites. So that, that was a question about those authentic sites. So I have spoken about these sites here and here, uh, you know, here. So if you can use that, uh, that that will be, uh, you know, useful for, for, for a start. Or, you know, there are uh, these scraping sites or we have apps from where we can, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, download uh, the data that we, uh, yeah, I will, uh, I'm, I'm seeing the questions and I will I, I will talk about that. Thank you so much. Please keep the questions coming. That's important because uh, I can't see anybody on the screen. So your questions are important. Now we can import live data into Google spreadsheets and also into Excel. The, uh, you just have to type is equal to import data and you write the URL. Then that data comes onto your Google spreadsheet. You even can, you know, uh, take it from those Wikipedia tables. For example, uh, there are three, uh, uh, you know, information you have to provide the URL and then the uh, structure of the URL you take from and the number. So uh, if you see the third uh, point here, it talks about import HTML. So you are importing data from Wikipedia sites. This one is about the demographics of India. You write table and four here because you know, it's the fourth item on the uh, Wikipedia page. So that way you can, you know, uh, simply import all this data into your spreadsheets. There are uh, importing live data options into Excel exactly in the same way. So you can import all that data that you get there. You don't have to, you know, kind of put it in a separate format. It is, it is live data. The, the, the uh, beauty of the live data is that it keeps on updating as the data on the actual website keeps on updating. Now comes to the uh, now we come to the most important part of it, uh, data analysis, and all these you know these are these are methods by which you know we can find out stories from the data that we have just extracted. So I will take some time to explain uh, all this because this is this this is a very uh, important area of data analysis. Because once we have data, as I said, we must know uh, what questions we are asking about. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. The first one is about uh, the measurement. If, if there are particular measurements, what is the exact measurement? I mean, if we are talking about COVID figures, then you know, the exact numbers that we are being provided is the measurement. And that's important, you know, providing the full picture. Because why we are doing uh, all this data journalism as journalists is because we know how to make stories out of it. We know how to uh, draw associations out of it. And that is very important. Because just plain numbers don't make a story. Was there a government decision? Was there a drug introduced? Was there, what was the fact? So you have to explain the significance. And that's where, you know, these questions are important. So the first analysis that we can make from the data, which is publicly available is we, uh, we provide a full measurement of that. The second thing is uh, we are trying to, you know, talk about the proportion, how much proportion, how much proportion of, of, of the world, how much proportion of the you know, uh, of, of the state, of the nation, etc. So data or, or the particular measure that we're talking about, then we can talk about proportion. But it's very important that we talk, when we talk, when we compare percentages, we know, uh, you know, the base. Because if the base is very high, then, then the percentage, a smaller percentage is doing something else. So that, that, you know, that very simple statistical knowledge is very important for journalists because, you know, we are assuming that the, journal, the journalistic knowledge is there. Now we are talking about this numerical knowledge. So the proportion is, is a very important method of you know finding out story that this much proportion is there or this much proportion or this much percentage or uh, so on and so forth. So that's a very important story in the second part. The internal comparison again is very important. You know, comparing with how, what you wear or you know comparing with, with your structure maybe sometime back or maybe in a different situation. External comparison, very, very important. How far are you from the national average? Comparing yourself with other states. Say, for example, if I'm talking about uh, maybe transport in a particular state, so how does it compare with other states? And these are stories because uh, they provide us with trends. And, and these comparative figures are always stories that we are much better off than the national average or we are worse off than the national average. We are better off than the global average. We are 
worse off than the global average, so on and so forth. So this internal and external comparisons are very important because uh, we say these outliers make stories. If something is very, very far away from the mean, that's a story. If something is very, very less from the mean, that's a story. So when we are analyzing on the Google spreadsheet or on the Excel, I'm just limiting myself to these two. Uh, in my last slide, probably I'll talk a little bit about coding. So uh, this comparison is very important. Uh, then the change over time, how has it changed over time? I mean, uh, these days we are used to seeing these COVID figures and we know, you know, when, uh, you know what it means, you know, when they're, when they're changing over time. So that's another story uh, that we have to look at the data. How has it changed over time? How has it changed over the last five years, last 10 years, last 10 days, etc. That depends on the question that you're asking. But I'm just talking about the possibilities of extracting stories from that data. So that's one idea. League tables are just like, you know, putting information about maybe four or five states or four or five districts or four or five countries, etc. Just like, you know, we have those IPL league tables or we have the World Cup league tables. Sorry to talk about sports when there is no sporting action, but, you know, this is just an idea of, of you know, trying to tell you this is how we can extract information from the league tables as well. Analysis by categories, by, by, by smaller categories. From the health, you know, as I said, you know, we can get an, uh, analyzing by these categories. Association, uh, trying to draw relations between you know certain events or certain categories, uh, so on and so forth. So these are uh, seven or eight ideas of you know extracting stories from the data, trying to provide the full picture, trying to provide uh, uh, what proportion, trying to uh, you know look at internal comparison, trying to look at external comparison, trying to uh, uh, look at the change over time, you know, looking at league tables, and analyzing categories, and trying to draw associations at the same time. But we have to keep it as an exercise in imagination. We have to be extremely creative in thinking of the alternative stories that might be consistent. So you remember I spoke of being open-minded and you know, being uh, you know creative and all that. So this is this is very important. Being curious, being creative, and being critical. So this is important. But what other story could explain this? This is the explanation maybe provided by the officials, or this is the explanation provided by a section of uh, people you know watching. So what, what, what are the alternative explanations to this? So this is an exercise in, in, in imagination. As I said, using journalistic tools to find out questions from the data source. Data is just an additional source which is available to me. And more importantly, it is available to readers as well. So they can find out for themselves what the story is or if there is anything wrong there. So they can uh, you know, uh, point it out to you. So that uh, verifiability is important, especially in the crisis that journalism finds itself these days. And good data journalism is not easy. It's just, I mean, if it, if it were easy, then uh, uh, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be uh, having a webinar on that. So this, this is, you know, it requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of figuring out. It requires a lot of, uh, you know, understanding. So it means figuring out, first of all, how to get the data. The second point I haven't written it, the most important part, how to clean the data. Now cleaning data is, is another very important area that I don't want to touch upon right now, but how to understand it and how to find the story. And that's very important. So that knows for news is what, what sets journalists apart from everybody else. What, what journalists can see uh, in a story, normally other people can't. And uh, statisticians are uh, notorious for not being very good communicators and that's where we come in. Probably if, if need be, and if we know what questions to ask, and if we do not have the tools right away, then we can ask our stat statisticians or even, even our computer science people. There are many uh, places in uh, uh, you know uh, United States and, 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 and European countries where they have a dual degree of journalism and computer science, where people you know uh, uh, learn a little bit of computer science, learn a little bit of journalism, so that you know they can understand uh, how to get this data, how to analyze it, and how to find the story. So both these. Uh, skills are very important of uh, asking or uh, you know getting the tools to extract the data probably a lot of coding etc and then we have to uh, you know find out how to understand the data and how to find the story out of it and I'm, 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 i keep on reading to uh, yeah yeah there is a, there's a question about the framework i'll talk about the framework in a moment thank you so much Adam. Data journalism is the future. Journalists need to be data savvy. I mean, uh, that there, were, there were times and we have all those legendary stories when we sit back in press clubs and people say that, you know, how they would, you know, chat up to people and how they would end up with stories, you know. But you, uh, there you were supposed to know or you were uh, to know, uh, if you didn't know the right people at the right places, then you would never get the stories. The 
uh, easy part here is that we know where to look for. Now it's about you know pouring over this data and equipping yourself with the tools to analyze it and pick out the interesting stories. So uh, that's why it is uh, there. Now data journalism is, is, is taught at very very different levels. If it is taught to journalists, then we are talking about you know only about these uh, uh, the uh, hard skills, not the soft skills. If I talk about the journalism skills as a soft skill, then the data extraction and analysis as the soft skills then journalists probably have to be taught about these hard skills so say for example uh, uh, thanks to unicef rajasthan and a lot of other people you know have been able to conduct these data journalism workshops for journalists in different parts of the country and that's where we just uh, you know uh, uh, take them straight away to uh, uh, these uh, you know data analysis part you know taking them on a google sheet uh, making them you know uh, draw in data sets and then ask questions out, out of those uh, uh, data sets so these are the hard skills required for journalists. But if you're talking about students, then we have to keep a balance between uh, you know uh, the soft skills and the hard skills because uh, the soft skills of journalism are very important of using the uh, journalistic ethics and the, you know uh, uh, doing it for public interest. We are asking questions for ourselves, but because it is in the public interest. Uh, yeah, I spoke about these uh, sources uh, beginning, but for those of uh, uh, you who are joining now. Much of it is uh, not affected by the official secret act because uh, uh, the uh, mandate of the uh, right to information act is that you have to, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, provide this data upfront. You have to make this available to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make it available to everybody. So kindly uh, suggest uh, uh, user-friendly software for data analysis. Thank you, ma'am. This is exactly the slide that you know have come to. Uh, this is what I, I, I'm talking about. This is one very important uh, structure, uh, you know, a very uh, important thing for uh, you know data analysis using pivot table in Excel because an Excel uh, spreadsheet as it is may not provide us the right insights or the right trends or the right uh, stories uh, for you know uh, data analysis. So uh, one technique that we have to learn is the you know data uh, analysis uh, uh, you know techniques. The data journalism highest that I spoke about, you know, it, it, it talks about all that, uh, you know, uh, pivot tables. So you have to know pivot tables. If you know pivot tables, then you would know, you know, how to excite. Because when you're doing pivot tables, you're not uh, touching the uh, actual uh, questions. Yeah, ethical questions are very important, you know, because uh, I, I'll come to that. There are, there are some wonderful uh, books on that. I don't want to just uh, emphasize more on the books, but. Uh, there are sites like datajournalism.com. Uh, so if you go to datajournalism.com, there are a lot of these uh, issues discussed there as well. So if you uh, want to turn your data into a beautiful report or a dashboard, then go ahead with the uh, pivot table because it's a very, very important tool. And it, this is this is one tool that every student should know. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, uh, and I keep repeating that, that when we started journalism, Microsoft Word was one skill that we had to teach ourselves, you know, trying to increase our word speed and, you know, trying to uh, type in with uh, 10 fingers. So if you uh, look for uh, journalists as old as, uh, you know, uh, uh, two decades back, that is my generation, you will find out that, you know, all those journalists, they can type with those 10 fingers because uh, they probably, you know, first learned typing and then came to uh, journalism. So uh, the skill required for journalists these days would be, you know, to, to know these uh, pivot tables because otherwise it's very, very difficult and people are scared of the numbers. I've had people asking questions to see if I do a story and if I, you know, analyze it wrongly and, and I pulled it out, you know what it might happen. And if it's a financial story, you know, I might be sued and, you know, I would uh, go to jail if I could. And that's very important to uh, be very confident about what you're doing. The uh, 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 analysis and the calculations are done by all this wonderful, beautiful software. We just have to know the, the right questions and that's what I keep on emphasizing. So pivot tables is one very, very simple and one very effective tool to uh, start analyzing data, which I taught uh, a few slides back of how to you know, extract that data. Then uh, another uh, uh, thing that is easily available, and this is from a screenshot. If you see on the top right, you will uh, see my picture there. So just to uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, emphasize that these are things that are freely and easily available. Google Data Studio is another very important tool where you know it provides uh, options for uh, both uh, data analysis and for data visualization it's important that we must know uh, the right tools to uh, you know uh, keep these this, this data uh, you know in a form in which 
it's it's uh, uh, you know the uh, exact story is is, is known to, the, to to my readers because uh, uh, apart from uh, acquiring an analysis presentation of that data is very very important whether you are doing it in form of a narrative structure or whether you are providing it in forms of a uh, uh, whether you are providing it in in, in form of uh, uh, you know uh, visualization that's very important yeah there are questions on machine learning and artificial intelligence i and i i, I will definitely talk about that uh, in, in this presentation uh, the question to the host uh, how much time do i have uh, yes you have almost 15 minutes more okay okay then then i'll have uh, or uh, what's the format do you have uh, uh, questions yeah, in between? Go ahead. Continue your presentation because it's very uh, uh, technical savvy. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. So uh, Google Studio is one option where, where which you can you know try out. You just need to have a Google account and you know there are uh, free tutorials available and uh, you know you can even get a certificate out of those uh, free tutorials. So Google Data Studio is something which uh, is a free resource available to you know both analyze data and to find out very good uh, you know presentable uh, figures out of it so this is another resource that i can talk about uh, i was also talking about you know this interactive uh, resource uh, uh, you know sometime back uh, this again is you know from my own uh, flourish studio uh, uh, page and uh, this this i had you know posted in facebook uh, sometime back where you can see we have uh, this uh, you know interactive figure of all the 540 constituencies, looks of a constituency across India and one uh, every any user has to just you know touch on that and he can get all the information. This was just about you know number of contestants and the voting percentages but uh, uh, from uh, the election commission of India uh, figure you know you can uh, merge it with the uh, uh, these interactive tools available and you can find uh, you can present these extremely interactive you know figures for readers and because you know everybody might not be interested about the all the 542 constituencies but you could be interested about one particular constituency where you stay or where you want to know about you just have to click onto that and you get to know about it uh, i haven't spoken about uh, python i haven't spoken about r and i haven't spoken about the coding skills but they are also going to be very important but let me emphasize that is not uh, data journalism right at the beginning or that is not even you know what you might never need at all so uh, data journalism can be you know very simple uh, uh, you know data sets it can be very simple questions using all the tools that i have just described and finding the right answers and then accentuating those answers with real people so if i'm talking about uh, maybe uh, what is scarcity somewhere and if i have uh, all the data available to me then you know probably i could start off with an individual because you know we know all these tricks of human interest stories and all that so we, we start about uh, 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 you know uh, yeah i'll talk about the thank you man i'll talk about the official cp side so we'll talk about uh, you know uh, the uh, individual human interest story and then we get on to uh, you know uh, the uh, bigger story and then you know probably related to uh, as i said you know with the internal comparisons and external comparisons and all, and then provide interactive figures with that because all these things you know are different for different platforms if it is for a digital platform then you might use these interactive features if it is not for a digital platform then it has to be in maybe in a 3d picture or a picture which makes sense or which provides the right information there are huge many books you know about how data can lie or how visualizations can not always uh, speak the entire truth so we have to be very careful about that now as i said uh, we uh, have uh, you know uh, simple statistical explanations provided by you know all these available free tools or even maybe proprietary software a lot of these tools that i spoke of most of the uh, tools that i spoke of here are free maybe uh, excel is a proprietary software so that's why i didn't get into uh, the details of it but there are a lot of these coding techniques about trying to find out uh, or trying to extract data and then to clean it and then to you know make sense out of it so uh, all these techniques are extremely easy they are not difficult at all because you just need to you know uh, put in maybe a few months of practice to get acquainted maybe with python or r software or maybe just one uh, r or, or, or python whatever you are comfortable in because once you know one uh, particular computer programming language the other comes very easily to you then all these packages they call them library they are all available you just have to do a copy pasting job and put in your data and ask the question 
So you don't have to write down all those big codes. They, they have been done by people. I mean, R is an open software, uh, open source software, and so is Python. So all these libraries and, and uh, hundreds and thousands of them. In fact, every analysis that you can think of, somebody has already done it, and it is easily available. You just uh, take it down, and you, uh, you know, you can uh, provide uh, information with that. Yeah, public data is one data that is available to everybody. Otherwise, you know, we can use uh, methods of, uh, you know, right to information uh, and all to uh, ask for data, because that is what a lot of activists and a lot of uh, journalists do of uh, trying to find out data which is not public. So uh, much of this, uh, majority of the work we are doing will, will not impinge on the official secret act because you know they are mandated to provide all this information out in, in the public domain. If it is not in the public domain, then you have to maybe talk to the database administrator because uh, apart from Excel, another skill that you will have to learn is the MySQL. How to you know learn with those? How to uh, interact with those relational databases? Now, uh, very quickly, I will also talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and what we know by that. Now, there are some wonderful packages, you know, uh, one of them is Scikit Learning on Python, SCI Scikit Kit Learning on, on Python, or, you know, Natural Language uh, Toolkit, NLTK, and, 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 you know, many such uh, uh, programs which are available. TensorFlow by Google. So all these uh, uh, packages are available. What happened, or the biggest difference between uh, artificial, uh, you know, machine learning and the coding is this. Say, for example, I have to, uh, you know, kind of uh, tell the computer that what a cat looks like. Then I have to say that okay, it has four legs, it has fur, it has two eyes, it meows, it does this. So I have to keep in all the, uh, you know, uh, conditions. If all this is satisfied, then that is a cat. That is how roughly coding works. We, provide a lot with if and else statements or if and then you know statements so if this if this if this then this what machine learning does is that we feed the computer or we feed the package with hundreds and thousands of pictures of cats from various angles so that the next time uh, you know uh, the computer uh, program sees a cat it can very safely say that it is a cat now the cat example is very simple but imagine you know uh, the computer can even recognize the facebook can recognize you even from a blurred picture so there is machine learning at play when you are typing on on, on a google mail you know they, they are telling you what the next word could be so that is uh, you know natural language processing uh, at, at, at play natural language programming so uh, this nlp techniques or these techniques of using you know uh, previous methods to uh, you know, extrapolate it to you know uh, future method this is a very simple technique of machine learning for example, uh, you know, we had uh, stories like, uh, you know, which plane path was a spy plane path. So they would, you know, take, this is all available on website. So if, if people took out hundreds of pictures of regular aeroplane paths, which is known as the training data set. So you have to provide that training data set of hundreds of, you know, original paths to the computer uh, on a machine learning program. And then you test that and you refine your data sets. So all this is done by the computers. This is, uh, they go through various layers. So machine learning also is a very important process, but uh, machine learning need not be, you know, what you have to do right at the beginning, but many people are doing depending on the resources and all that can be a very specialized area of using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So uh, that, that, that is in just was, uh, you know, what, what machine learning is about. We train the uh, computer often using cloud computing because the processing power of my computer could be very less. So there is a, a Google Colab research. If you search for Google Colab research, you can actually, you know, work on Google Cloud to do all that processing. Uh, this is possible uh, by, you know, training all those data sets and like uh, making, uh, letting them make predictions and, you know, trying to find out the accuracy of those predictions. Now, if you've seen, uh, you know, the language program, then you, you, you would definitely know that uh, it's still there's a long way to go, especially with translations and all. And uh, we we find you know laughable translations on uh, uh, Google Translate, even you know when it is translated from Bengali to English or from Hindi to English, etc. So there's still a long way to go as far as it goes. But it is all about training them with millions and millions of data sets. So we had all those image data sets and all. In fact, uh, uh, Google has a paid program for you know uh, uh, you know all these machine learning programs. And all. But TensorFlow is one area where Google provides all this for. Uh, almost free. 
uh, as i said you know this is going to be very very uh, uh, important maybe maybe in future because a lot of statistical questions especially are answered very easily by r and you know we are having all these things very specifically you know for uh, mass communication and uh, journalism school so we will have to you know deal with all these coding practices also uh, in, in 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 the near uh, future uh that's all for the presentation i will uh, leave another uh, four or five minutes for any questions that you might have or anything else that you would want me to uh, you know expound upon thank you very much i mean it's been a uh, wonderful you know uh, being present here what? yeah here is the questions are there kindly suggest an authentic site from where we can get information related to covid 19 wow so i mean uh, there are a lot of you know uh, those uh, world health organization things and all we have all government sites it's important that you know we uh, uh, go for those uh, search that i told you the refined advanced google power searches if you were looking for an excel format just write file type excel or xls or file type csv and that is where uh, it comes across sir if you can kindly explain how data journalism visual journalism and infographics is connected visual journalism is uh, uh, different uh, but you know uh, data journalism as i said is data is journalism first data second so data we are using just as a source or a tool and infographics is a very very important element of uh, you know data journalism because presentation of data is uh, as important as you know acquiring or uh, you know analyzing the data there is a specific framework or design as i said you know it's different for journalists is different for ug courses it's different for pg courses it's different for specialized courses so we have uh, you know all those programs of one full semester you know uh, six credits and beyond for data journalism and i'm sure uh, you know we will also be following that path because this is very very important for uh, uh, journalists to be you know uh, or or the uh, coming journalists because as as they say that you know uh this computational thinking is what comes very naturally to our present generation of student so we have to provide them with the computational thinking processes that they already uh, have access to we have to talk about uh, uh, things okay so what i was talking about uh, narrative journalism and data journalism was from uh, c w anderson uh, 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 you know idea and many people's idea that you know when journalism assumes that or when journalism suggests that you know we have the right tools to parse the social reality we basically go through two different processes one is the narrative journalism process where we use a particular structure to convince people that okay whatever i'm saying is the truth or you know i have the right tools to uh, say uh, take truth to you i was trying to you know pitch data journalism diametrical not i you know philip mayer has done it uh, you know almost five decades back so i was trying to emphasize on uh you know the the uh, you know kind of progression from narrative journalism to data journalism so uh, right now people suggest that you know we can draw on both of that and use evidence based data journalism so uh, that is what it was about that was from uh, some uh, hafiz okay i hope that's clear because you know if it's not clear you know i can answer that again very tools and uh, platforms for data verification this was uh, basically not about data verification but you know uh, trying to find out about the uh, website that you uh, you know we have a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, tools to find out the, about the website that you are you know downloading it from so if it is you know a, a, you know a, a good uh, uh, official website or reliable site or you know something which is accountable then we can you know take it how are the official secrets act affecting no i mean this doesn't uh, generally official secrets i don't follow because you know uh, we have uh, the right to information act with overrides much of it you know, it has to it's not just public data it's data you know that we can you know uh, ask out from uh, you know other places i was talking about public data because it's very easy for everybody to you know start off with that you don't have to but there are means in which you can you know you can get it from uh, other places data visualizations are seen as providing opportunities for telling of complex or technical stories in direct uh, way for finding stories in data for de developing new visual dimensions and reporting stories and so on could you please throw some light on the uh, uh, theoretical and philosophical underpinnings of diagrammatization society with data generation yeah this is a very important area you know of, of our data fiction and so on and so forth so i i spoke about you know the uh, uh, thank you so much sir and so nice to see my guru sir <laughs> professor jayendra sir thank you. Sir, uh, there is two more people who has raised hand. Uh -huh. uh, can you take their questions? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I would. Uh, Sha Shaki Bama. 
Hello, uh, sir. I have one question. What uh -huh. is league tables in a data analysis? I, I didn't get you. League tables or league tables oh, in data okay. analysis. Okay, okay, okay. I was just telling you know certain ways in which you know you can draw an information uh, from a data source. So one of the options I was try trying to tell you is you know using it like a league table, like you know maybe for, maybe using four or five different states or four or five different countries, and we tell them this is where they stand on this and that. I'm sure if you have see, seen those sporting league tables, you know they are talking of maybe uh, Italy, Germany, France, so on and so forth, and then you know you provide their points and goals for and so on and so. Forth. So I was trying to tell you, uh, you know, league tables in a manner in which, you know, this is how you can draw stories out of the league tables. That is one uh, way of extracting stories from data. I spoke of many other, uh, you know, seven other aspects. League table was one of it. I spoke of inter internal comparison. I spoke of external comparison. I spoke of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, proportion and measurement and so on and so forth. So league table was uh, one format. Any other question? There is one more question from uh, uh, Momta Hafiz. Ah, ha, ha. Please, please come in. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank uh -huh. you for such a technical, saving, and informative session. And it's Thank almost you, clear. Sir, I wanted to ask a different question, however, I won't ah. know uh, because ultimately ah. the story is not about the data, but ah, the ah, subject ah. that, you know, around which the data revolves. Ah, 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 ah. Sir, at the beginning of your uh, talk, you talked about literally fiction and narrative journalism. Uh -huh. So since we know that narrative journalism is also called as intimate journalism, and we have to get into the lives of our subject. Sir, I wanted to ask how to make peace with ethics. For example, we, if we have a good story and the subject doesn't permit us to do so, and, and we know we don't have an alternative, and we also know that it's like uh, in public interest, how should we make peace with it? Should we leave it or find some other way to do it? No, I mean, of course, of course, thank you so much. So, uh, as, as I said, you know, uh, one problem, uh, narrative journalism, of course, is very interesting. It makes for good reading and we want to, you know, uh, go into all that. Now, there's also, you know, the concept of using emotion vis-a-vis -vis objectivity. You know, there are lots and lots of issues involved. There. What I was trying to uh, uh, emphasize was about, you know, providing the evidence. So, when you're talking about one particular, you know, person, then we want to show whether it is a part of a particular trend or whether it is a one-off case or, you know, whether, uh, you know, you can uh, make uh, more sense out of it. So that's where, you know, I was trying to pitch it different from uh, narrative journalism. Both of them are here to stay. I'm saying that, you know, we have to use journalistic techniques to ask these questions to make sense, to, you know, uh, look for the woods in the trees. So uh, making sense, maybe in the larger perspective, may, uh, trying to see, you know, whether, you know, it is thematic or it is episodic or so forth. But we have to make all those, uh, you know, uh, you know, choices. And the most important thing, as I keep on repeating, is that you know, when we are talking as professional journalists, we have to talk in terms of the journalistic ethics, and we have to talk about topic interest. We have to, you know, keep on doing all the things that we do as journalists, uh, as far as ethical uh, considerations are there. And secondly, doing things in public interest. If it is in public interest, then go ahead. Uh, but you know, uh, keeping in mind people's, uh, you know, dignity. Their dignity should not be affected. I thank again, you know, my guru, uh, Professor Behra, for this opportunity. And, uh, and I, I, I will. <laughs> okay, many thanks, uh, Dr. Uma Sankar Pandey. Now I request uh, Professor Sumil, Sumil Kant Behra to have a overlook on this uh, discussion of the Dr. Uma, Uma Sankar Pandey. I was actually, uh, thank you, Uma Sankar. I was eagerly waiting to. Uh, attend your um, talk and um, it was wonderful it was a learning experience for me and uh, the questions that uh, have been raised were also equally very important but somewhere perhaps people have uh, uh, failed to make a distinction between narrative and data journalism you have rightly said that data journalism also, data can also be presented in a narrative form if you have the creative exactly. abilities. Exactly. If you look at till now, it is not only data that we are uh, making human interest or narrative um, presentations. Look at the budget that we are uh, um, presenting stories about budget. Budget is all about numbers. Budget is all about statistics. Budget is all about percentages. But we make stories, narratives out of that. 
how it affects the common man, how it affects the business people, how it affects the um, um, housewives, uh, all these things. So we have been using data to prepare narrative journalism. You have very rightly started from what is journalism. I don't know. I am basically a student, even if I am a teacher. <laughs> you see, uh, I don't know how many of my young colleagues have noted down. If they have noted down, because they have understood, I realize, from their questions, but many of them should make it a point. Very structured manner you made your presentation. Why? I will take one minute, Upendra Babu. Uh, this is a message for the participants, actually. Uh, you have started from journalism, narrative journalism, then uh, precision journalism, then you talked about uh, your data ecosystem, then you moved to data journalism. And then you also talked about the pitfalls. What are the uh, disadvantages? So you went to the good arts law, where measure, if you, when a measure becomes a target, then that is not a good measure. And then also you have talked about the sourcing of data, the analysis of data, and how data, what data doesn't tell us. All these things we need to find out when we look at data and the objectives, objectives you made, and you also talked about the books, very important books. And then you went to uh, the data as source and tool, different tools and kits. I'm simply repeating these things about uh, to tell you the structuring, the participants, if they would have noted down, perhaps there would have been a lot of clarity in their understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, getting started, you have said how to get data. You have talked about the data research, uh, uh, data set search dot research google dot com and public databases. And then in the meanwhile, you have also talked about the necessity of making data journalism a part of the bachelor's and master's <laughs> curriculum. <laughs> and, uh, and the data from the web, uh, the government data. And one to one question, I will um, give this answer. When you talked about data analysis, you talked about measurement, proportion, internal comparison, then external comparison, uh, change over time, leak tables, everything. Now, there you have talked that exacting stories from the data. Exacting stories from the data doesn't necessarily mean a quantitative story. It can be a narrative story where you can use emotions, where you can use the people's reactions. You can create a narrative out of it. Because you need not only look at the source of data, not only look at the, the analytical parameters and how you can relate it to the society. That relational also um, you have talked about. So it's a very wonderful um, talk, oh. Umar Shankar. And you, now I don't, uh, I am really happy uh, for so. the benefit of the participants. Let me tell you that uh, he is the only faculty member in our communication fraternity who must have done about seven to eight courses, online courses during this pandemic. That Thank was a wonderful uh, use of time, Uma Sankar. Thank Look at so Uma much. Sankar, he experienced the Ampan, and he is the, <laughs> even today the Calcutta is without electricity, some parts of Calcutta, yet he has been uh, doing uh, tremendous work, attended uh, online courses, and prepared for this. It's a wonderful topic, and definitely you deserve Uma Sankar. Today people know Uma Sankar as the international face of the younger Indian Thank you. communication academics. Thank you so, so much, sir. My good wishes and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. a wonderful talk. And Thank I am so sure that the participants will be immensely happy with this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for your nice uh, observation about uh, Dr. Umar Sankar. Uh, just one the thing. I welcome uh, now uh, my colleague, uh, um, um, uh, Anjuman Bora. Uh, okay, okay, sir. I, I, I will come to that. So yeah, yeah. after after uh, 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 pre, pre observation of Dr. Sunil Kant Behra about Dr. Umar Sankar Pandey's presentation today, I have nothing to say. Only I can say, really, uh, USP you made a very splendid session today, very useful for all of us. I can say these words. With these words, I extend my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Umar Pandey for uh, giving us some time. 
sharing his valuable ideas with us, with our participants. Many thanks to you. And uh, certainly we'll see you in some other issues in some other occasion you speak. Have a nice Thank day. Thank Have you. a nice Thank day. You. So Thank all, uh, by request to all participants, don't uh, leave the session. Uh, very shortly we'll go for the next session. Already our resource person, uh, Dr. Anjuman uh, uh, Bora has joined with us already. And uh, uh, we'll go for the next session. And as you all know, uh, Dr. Anjuman Bora is an assistant professor in the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Tajpur University, Assam, where she has been a faculty member since uh, the year 2009. She completed her PhD and master's degree with gold medal in Mass Communication and Journalism from Tajpur University and bachelor's degree in English literature from Guwahati University. Her PhD research was in the area of media and children's participation. In her thesis uh, titled uh, Advocating Children's Participation, a case study of children's media interactions in India. So uh, uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Anjuman Bora to our uh, second session of the third series of the third day webinar. We are very happy that uh, Dr. Anjuman Bora has joined with us. And uh, particularly, uh, Dr. Anjuman Bora will highlight on the children and media listening to the on her voice. So this, during this COVID period, uh, this pandemic situation, the topic uh, assigned to Dr. Anjuman Bora is really very interesting. Let us uh, listen to Dr. Anjuman Bora during this COVID-19 pandemic situation. I hope our discussion will really give a light to all of us during this pandemic situation. I request Dr. Anjuman Bora to continue her discussion. Thank you so much, sir, for this kind introduction. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone and uh, gratitude to the organizers led by the very dynamic Prof. Badi and my most respected teacher, Prof. Behra, for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this webinar series. In fact, I've been following uh, all the sessions during this uh, uh, webinar series and uh, uh, I must say the sessions have been so fruitful, so informative, so excellent. And uh, especially after uh, the lecture by uh, Dr. Uma Shankar Pandey just a few minutes back, I think the bar has been really raised. And uh, uh, I just hope I'll be able to live up to everyone's expectations. Probably I should start with a drink of water. <laughs> So uh, the topic that I have chosen for deliberation today is uh, children and media listening to the unheard voices. Perhaps there is hardly any need to emphasize that children form a sizable segment of media audiences in today's world. And we are all aware of the fact that children's interaction with media has a very crucial role to play in childhood culture, in development, in children's behavior, uh, how they grow up to be adults and uh, how to influence society. Unfortunately, children's media creation today has become a huge profit-making industry with very little consideration for these factors. Children receive massive attention from advertisers and commercial broadcasters, yet they remain the most marginalized in terms of content that is truly beneficial to them. Uh, in fact, uh, children's media content is often produced to attract children, but with very little or no concern for their well-being. And, uh, uh, at the same time, there is a large scale denial of spaces for issues related to children, denial of spaces for children to express their own opinions and matters that affect them and that help them to grow as meaningful adults. Uh, there has been a historical legacy of children being seen and not heard. And uh, I think this phenomena is very, very pronounced even in the case of media. And uh, if I just draw from the present situation, where there is a barrage of information, so much of communication happening around the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, 
during this period we are hearing from everyone we are hearing from experts from non experts uh, from doctors from people who are stranded from uh, educationists who are worried about children's futures but i think we have rarely heard from children themselves nobody has really uh, been asking children about how this uh, pandemic has affected them how is it so that uh, they are coping how are they negotiating with this present crisis which is unprecedented for for them and uh, they also do not have the resources to really deal with it so as uh, media scholars i feel it is essential that we not merely view children as uh, passive users or consumers of media but instead as prosumers who can actively influence and constructively shape the content that is being created for them we really need to look at them as individuals having communication rights like any other adult person uh, the intent of my discussion today is, is in fact focus on children's communication rights and uh, enthuse and nudge communication scholars and researchers to turn their scholarly attention to children not just as uh, special audiences of media whose need uh, whose uh, needs are to be sensitively addressed but uh, more importantly as equal audiences as co-creators as uh, rights holders entitled to claiming not just visibility but also voice okay ma'am i have given you the uh, screen share access you yeah so uh, yes i will now uh, share my screen and uh, i will start off by uh, talking about the research trends in children and media so let me share my screen okay so uh, let me just very briefly uh, summarize in fact uh, the research trends that we see in the area of uh, children and media so uh, the relationship between children and media has been the subject of extensive research for a very long time now uh, however it has predominantly been uh, articulated through uh, media effects discourses and till today media effects research remains the primary lens through which uh, uh we look at the media the the media children relationship uh, another very uh, prominent uh, uh, frame for analysis of the interaction between children and media uh, has been through the construction of the figure of the child in the media or the representation of child in the media uh, in fact there is a growing discourse uh, uh, regarding the under representation and the insensitive representation of uh, children in the news media however most of the scholarly discourses uh, uh, continue to view children merely as subjects of uh, you know socialization as objects of socialization and they uh, largely remain silent on the question of the child as a subject who might participate in media discourses as an adult in process uh, with his or her own desires opinions and issues and uh, the right to a range of media and communication experiences so uh, today in fact uh, i would like to provide a theoretical backdrop and some research ideas for uh, those who would like to take up research in the area of children and uh, media participation uh, i would not like to confine myself to uh, children and media alone but i would like to look at uh, children participation in a broader context uh, because uh, i do not really see communication and participation to be entirely separate from each other as uh, uh, you know the uh, very known communication scholar uh, gumishwar dagron puts it that uh, participation is in fact equal to communication and uh, the both these concepts are really entangled and you know knotted to each other like the strings of a fisherman's net so uh, i would like to start off by speaking about the theoretical context and uh, the policy dimensions within which to locate uh, children's participation and then i would go on to uh, the need for uh, need a scope for research in this area so uh, to begin with it is important to understand that uh, uh, you know the changing paradigms uh, of how society views children and how that has impacted children's participation so uh, the social norms you know the entire Uh, predicament about children's participation is rooted in the social norms that view children as uh, properties of adults as passive recipients of 
adult care and protection and the academic discourses that reinforce the construct of the child as an adult to be who is valued merely for their future potential rather than their present reality and uh, we can very clearly see this in the work of uh, Jean uh, Piaget uh, the well-known development psychologist uh, and uh, all of this has uh, really perpetuated the uh, you know, way how society looks at children. Uh, however, there is a paradigm shift now taking place regarding the place and status of children's voices in society. And within this new paradigm, children are, and young people are being uh, seen as active participants in the construction and determination of their own lives, in the lives of their families. And, and you know, they have been looked at as social actors. So, uh, uh, these, this new paradigm, which is also uh, kind of known as the new sociology of childhood, has in fact played a great role in shifting away from the uh, welfareist or the protectionist approach towards children to that of empowerment of the child. Uh, let us now look at uh, the diverse uh, worldviews about children's participation. Uh, in fact, uh, Children's participation is a new and emerging field. It's an emerging discipline, and it's a discipline which is still in search of a definition. So uh, uh, the way children's participation is uh, interpreted is open to a wide range of situations. However, uh, uh, I would uh, like to quote from some of the scholars in terms of how they like to call uh, uh, children's participation. So uh, some people call it a process in which children and youth engage with each other around issues that concern their individual and collective life conditions. Others, uh, including people like Roger Hart, who have done very pioneering work in the field of children's participation, call it a process of sharing decisions which affect one's own life and the life of the community in which one lives. And in fact, uh, Hart goes on to say that uh, children's participation should be the barometer against which democracy should be uh, evaluated. Again, uh, other communication uh, and uh, children's participation activists, uh, uh, Nandana Reddy and Kavita Ratna, uh, feel that uh, children's participation should include two broad frames. So one is a macro view, which uh, stresses the right and the ability of the child to advocate on one's own behalf and to be in control uh, and to be part of decision making processes. And uh, the other is a micro frame, which is more concerned with uh, participation leading to enhancement of children's personhood. So uh, 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 the, the macro view actually is uh, something that is advocating for uh, civil society participation, you know, uh, democratic participation. And the micro view is more concerned about what children gain from this uh, process of participation and how it co uh, positively contributes towards the process of the children's growth and development. Uh, again, uh, another uh, uh, scholar, uh, very well-known scholar in the field of children's participation, Martin Woodhead, says that uh, the understanding of uh, children's participation can uh, ha be in a large range, you know, with uh, things being situated at uh, two different ends of the entire spectrum, you know. So one end of the spectrum where adults allow children, you know, and I emphasize the word allow, adults allowing children uh, to offer their perspectives, in accordance with adults' view of the evolving capacities and uh, their understanding of the best interests of the children. Uh, and the other end of the spectrum is where children take action in their own rights, you know, as uh, 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 people who can confront, even confront adult authority and challenge adults' assumptions about their competence. In any case, uh, Woodhead maintains that for genuine participation, one has to move beyond the participation by consultation, you know, where uh, adults continue to make decisions. Uh, and instead of that, focus on uh, how young people can live active citizenship, where they have an effective part in decision making about their own lives and about their own future. Uh, 
today there is a growing understanding that uh, children's participation is most meaningful when it is rooted in children's uh, everyday lives so uh, what constitutes children's everyday lives uh, it has been identified as uh, very simple contexts like children's homes their schools their neighborhoods their play settings you know where children can participate through their own actions through their own choices through their relationship with other people and through their little contributions uh, hart however also cautions against the tendency to be uh, you know overly preoccupied by the idea of children's power because when you are talking of participation the question of empowerment is very uh, intric intricately linked to it however he cautions against uh, this uh, tendency to be overly preoccupied with this idea and also the propensity to misconstrue that the end goal of children's participation is to seek their liberation from adults or to let children have the last say so uh, uh, it is in fact important to uh, strike a balance and to focus on looking at what kind of resources children can draw upon uh, uh, in order to express their own agency and how these can shape uh their participation in different contexts so uh the current times the emphasis is on transformative participation so uh, uh transformative participation as uh, defined by sara white is uh is, is something that is understood understood to be aimed at empowerment uh to transform people's lives so in answering this question as to transformation for what in the context of uh, children's participation uh, roger hart uh, 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 puts out these three possibilities so first is uh, transformation for those involved uh, such as enhancement of their skills uh, experiences and networks that are built with children and young people uh, changed and improved relationship between children uh, you know the children uh, amongst children and between children and adults secondly uh, it could be transformation as a product of these activities such as you know because children got together uh, with adults and their own skills improve certain decisions can be changed and third is broad societal transformation due to the accumulate combination of the first two so uh, there is so much more to talk about uh, children's participation uh, uh, concepts and theories but however i would definitely like to uh, uh, talk about uh, i would not go on to so much but i would like to uh, talk about some of the models of children's participation so uh, the the uh, most uh, in fact uh, well known and uh, pioneering work uh, in terms of children's participation is Roger Hart's uh, ladder of participation which is in fact uh, uh, an adaptation of Sherry Arnstein's uh, ladder of participation which is one of the classical models for uh, explaining participation and uh, there are many other uh, uh, models of children's participation but most of them are uh, uh, either modifications or adaptations of the uh, of hart's ladder of participation so one of them is uh, treasurer's degrees of uh, involvement model which is an adaptation of hart's uh, uh, model and it is re redesigned by rearranging the levels of participation into a non hierarchical circle to eliminate the problems posed by the hierarchical nature of the ladder then uh, there is uh, barbara franklin's ladder of participation uh, which has uh, two additional runs uh, 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 along with the two uh, with the eight uh, uh, runs of hart's ladder it also has a zero level where children are not considered then there is a uh, uh, harish years pathways to participation model which uh, is uh, another model which is influenced by hart's ladder Uh, and uh, this model is aimed at functioning as a supplementary tool for helping practitioners working with children to explore different aspects 
of the participation process, which includes uh, what are the openings available for children's participation, what kind of opportunities the organization is making available for children to participate, and what kind of uh, uh, policy obligations the organization has to ensure that children's participation is happening. Then uh, there is uh, Garrison Lansdowne's typology of uh, participation where uh, uh, she talks of three categories of meaningful approaches in children's participation, which include the consultative process, the participative process, and uh, participation promoting self-advocacy. And uh, these three categories represent varying uh, you know, uh, degrees of control by children in the uh, participation process in the decision making process. Then uh, there is uh, Rakesh Rajani's model of adolescent participation and uh, I will not go into the details of each of uh, these models. Um, probably we can uh, look at some of these at some later opportunity and uh, I would definitely want to talk about the Reddy and Ratna's modified ladder which is one of uh, the most important uh, modifications that have been made to the uh, hearth ladder and uh, it, 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 it depicts a spectrum of 13 different possible roles that adults can play uh, uh, ranging from a negative to a positive one uh, when uh, coming to children's participation in facilitating children's participation so uh, from uh, Talking about the theoretical context, I would now want to move on to the policy context for uh, realizing children's uh, participation and uh, both in the international and the uh, national, from both the international and the national perspective. So uh, coming to the international perspective, the, it is the UNCRC or the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most important instrument, a policy instrument, when it comes to uh, understanding children's participation and realizing children's participation. And uh, in the national context, it is definitely the country's own statutory frameworks, you know, uh, which uh, are partially part of the uh, uh, political, ideological aspects of the country that is concerned and uh, it and it is also partially influenced by the UNCRC if that particular uh, country is a state party to the UN convention and has ratified the convention. So I will talk about those in detail. Let me first talk about uh, UNCRC and article uh, 12. So uh, uh, UNCRC is a legally binding international document that recognizes children as holders of rights and grants them the legal privilege to claim their rights. The convention, in fact, uh, it marked the beginning of a shift from the conventional attitude towards children as objects of adult protection to being recognized as individual human beings and holders of human rights. And uh, it is the UNCRC which in many ways sets out, uh, sets out a foundational uh, principles on which much of uh, theory and practice and research related to uh, children's uh, participation is currently built. And uh, the UNCRC asserts that children have the right to have a voice in decision making as well as the right to freedom of thought and expression. Uh, the, if, if you look at the provisions of the UNCRC, they are uh, uh, generally grouped into three P's, uh, protection, provision and participation. And the emphasis on participation is uh, very clear. It's very emphatic. And uh, uh, it is Article 12 of the UNCRC, which, uh, uh, which uh, enshrines the right to participation or the right to be heard, uh, along with few other uh, participatory rights uh, from Article 13 to Article 17, which includes uh, freedom of expression and information, freedom of association, access to information, uh, etc. So UNCRC is uh, a legal instrument and countries which uh, have ratified the convention. In fact, uh, the UNCRC is one of the highest ratified conventions, international treaties in the world. Uh, almost every country in the world has uh, ratified the UNCRC, including India in the year 1992. So uh, 
coming from the uh, uh, international context to the context of India. So in India, there are several statutory provisions that uh, uh, protect children's right to uh, participate. So uh, the most important is, of course, the Constitution of India. Um, the Constitution of India is an overarching framework uh, for all legislative and statutory activity in the country, and it applies equally to all citizens, which also includes children. So uh, the Constitution does not really uh, specifically mention the word participation, uh, uh, but uh, the right to participation uh, is in a way uh, included in Article 19, which enables individuals to participate in uh, public activities. Again, uh, there are the national policies and uh, uh, planning uh, frameworks. So uh, the national policy for children 2013 um, is the primary policy instrument which carries an articulation of the state's commitment to protect the rights of children in India. And uh, the National Plan of Action for Children or the NPAC 2016, uh, it uh, delineates a course of action for ensuring all rights to all children. So both the NPAC uh, 2016 and the uh, NPC 2013, they both allude to the UNCRC. They are guided by the principles of the uh, UNCRC, the rights-based uh, principles of the UNCRC, and it identifies right to par participation as one of its key priorities. Uh, then, of course, there is the National Commission for Protection of uh, child rights uh, and the commission is mandated to ensure that all laws policies programs and administrative mechanisms are in consonance with the child rights perspective uh, that is enshrined in the constitution of india and in the united nations convention on the rights of the child uh, of course, it's also important to mention about the legal framework and uh, in that context, it's important to talk about the Juvenile Justice Act uh, 2015 and the uh, POXO Act, uh, which is the uh, Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act. And uh, the pro all provisions related to civil and criminal proceedings uh, involving children in conflict with the law and children in need for care and protection are uh, uh, are all covered within the juvenile juvenile justice uh, act with ju the juvenile justice system and uh, the jj act also calls for friendly child friendly adjudication of uh, justice and uh, protection of children's right to be heard similarly the uh, POSCO Act also in its preamble itself identifies uh, uh, children's right to be heard and to uh, and to express their views and concerns as one of the primary principles of the POSCO Act. So, uh, so far I have uh, talked about the, uh, uh, the theoretical context and the, um, uh, the policy context for understanding children's participation. Now, uh, I would move on to uh, children, media, and participation. And uh, therein, uh, I would try to locate children's participation within the wider framework of children's participation in media. So uh, we all understand that uh, uh, media has a very important role in facilitating children's uh, participation. Because uh, in a democratic country, media cannot be viewed outside the social responsibility uh, framework and as a forum of the public sphere, media have the, cap the capacity as well as the responsibility to provide opportunities to common citizens, to ordinary citizens, to engage in exchange of ideas and information and to be part of media processes. Uh, in fact, uh, Habermas views media as a crucial constituent and catalyst uh, for uh, you know uh, the public sphere and uh, it, it considers that it is capable of offering the opportunity for communicative action again uh, nico carpentier who has done uh, uh, very important uh, work in the field of uh, uh, you know understanding the hegemonic uh, uh, role that media plays in enabling uh, citizens' participation, uh, he, he talks about differentiating, the importance of differentiating the concepts of participation in the media and participation 
through the media. So uh, participation through the media refers to opportunities for mediated participation in public debate and for self-representation in a variety of spaces. On the other hand, participation in the media deals with the participation of non-professionals in uh, the production of uh, media content and in uh, media decision making. So uh, uh, in, in this context, uh, Carpentier also points out that it is particularly the alternative forms of media rather than the mainstream media, uh, which have proven to be more successful in organizing more deepened forms of citizens' participation in the uh, media space. And uh, so I would really not want to get into the definition of uh, alternative media that is given here, but I would want to uh, emphasize that alternative and community media stand for and celebrate citizen or community participation in all phase or all phases of the media production uh, process and it represents a shift from the communicator centric to a more uh, uh, receiver centric orientation where meaning is sought and ascribed rather than information being transmitted in a uh, top down fashion so uh, if we want to really theorize children's uh, media's participation it's an arduous task because as citizens of a country children are also entitled to fair representation and participation in mainstream as well as alternative media spaces uh, the mainstream media space is already under criticism criticism for its apathetic attitude to uh, children's issues and in providing spaces to children to participate uh, however, in the last few decades, there have been uh, a number of initiatives by child focused uh, organizations in different parts of the world who have emerged to engage children in the creation of media content in uh, to alternative media platforms. Uh, however, there has been a conspicuous dearth of theoretical framework to inform children's media participation, whether in the mainstream media space or in the alternative media space. And uh, as an attempt to bridge this gap, I tried to construct a conceptual model for uh, understanding children's participation in alternative media spaces. And uh, I have called it the empowerment, empowerment factors model because uh, this model represents the ideal conditions or factors required for uh, facilitating empowerment enhancing and meaningful participation of children in alternative media spaces. So uh, I will take you briefly through this uh, model. So it's a model for children's participation in alternative media spaces. And uh, uh, if you look at this uh, 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 model, the, the central component of this model is the linkage between the facilitating agency and the children's uh, forum uh, which supports the children's media space and uh, two factors are very crucial uh, for creating conditions for meaningful and empowerment enhancing participation of uh, children to this linkage so the first one is simplification and demystification of media and uh, simplifying media and demystifying media is uh, very important if we have to uh, come away from the understanding of media as a uh, as a resource intensive as a technology intensive uh, platform uh, or uh, participative engagement and and, and a space that is difficult to engage with. So it is important to uh, simplify the understanding of media itself and uh, to demystify the entire uh, the technology centeredness of media itself so that it becomes easy for children to participate. So it, it should become a space where children can collectively engage in and uh, uh, create meaningful uh, discussions that matter to them. And the second is the transfer of resources, capacities, power, and control over media space to the children from the facilitating agency. Because if participation has to be meaningful, if participation has to be empowering, uh, and 
we want children to feel a sense of ownership about the children's media space, then it is very important that they are given uh, control over the resources. They are given control over uh, the decision making uh, uh, process. And it is important that their capacities are built so that they are able to meaningfully uh, engage in the media creation process without the handholding of adults, you know, so that they can uh, uh, grow that confidence that they can create media content. So these two are two of the most important factors. And apart from that, there are two other vital components that, are, that enable the facilitating agency to uh, practice empowerment enhancing participation. So uh, one is uh, the external boosters, the other is internal propellers. So by external boosters, I mean the presence of an enabling uh, statutory framework uh, which supports children's uh, participation, that respects children's participation, and uh, that kind of a policy framework, uh, statutory framework, which supports children's uh, participation would also give legitimacy to the efforts of the uh, facilitating agency to uh, engage in uh, participatory uh, media activities with children. At the same time, it is important to have a supportive mainstream media uh, environment which can amplify the voices of children and which can mainstream the uh, media content that is uh, being produced by the children. And uh, the second one, internal propellers. By this, I refer to a strong organizational culture of participation and uh, supporting structures so where uh, where there is uh, an environment for respect towards children respect of children's uh, individuality their uh, capacities their uh, agency and there is a constant uh, 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 encouraging environment where people really want to work for the well-being of children and uh, the final component that really brings together uh, this entire uh, model, sorry, is uh, the feedback uh, feed forward uh, mechanism, uh, which uh, which uh, which in a way processes the link of the media space to both the facilitating agency and to the internal propellers and the external boosters. So uh, this process is expected to provide inputs to the organization to revisit its uh, policies and revise its processes from time to time so, so as to make it uh, more appropriate and more adequate uh, to work with uh, children. At the same time, it is also expected that uh, uh, through this link, it will be possible to uh, uh, channel the media outputs uh, you know, to reach policymakers and lawmakers and thus help inform policy and legislation and uh, stimulate statutory processes and actions that uh, protect children's rights and impact their well-being. So uh, in a way, this model positions media participation uh, as central to uh, a participatory uh, process and uh, media participation pro uh, uh, works as the exists around which the entire process of children's participation is uh, anchored and uh, uh, it, it is something which could drive uh, the discourse around child rights to the center stage and help a more uh, create a more child friendly and uh, a rights enabling and respectful environment for children so uh, uh, having talked about uh, the various uh, a theoretical context uh, for uh, supporting children's uh, participation in general, as well as uh, a little attempt at uh, trying to inform children's participation in, in, in media. Uh, I would like to talk about some of the implications for future research. Uh, so I would want to uh, talk about what research, what kind of research can be taken up in the area of children's uh, participation and children's participation in media. So one could be to uh, uh, do analysis of uh, statutory frameworks 
for realizing children's participatory rights in India. So we have already talked about the policy context for ch realizing children's uh, uh, right to participation. And uh, of course, these uh, uh, policies do exist. Uh, the UNCRC does exist. The National Policy for Children does exist. The NPSC does exist. But uh, it is important to assess whether and to what extent these, provi these provisions have been effective in enabling children uh, participation to take place and uh, research uh, is also to be undertaken to understand the outcomes of the various measures that have been undertaken to uh, to secure children's rights in fact uh, uh, in such a setting it could be important to explore uh, the experiences of children in various settings in in various contexts in their everyday lives in uh, invited settings everywhere you know and uh, it could really draw upon uh, stories of children uh, to understand uh, how far uh, and how uh, far reaching the outcomes of these measures have been again uh, <clears throat> We have seen the establishment of uh, Baal Sansads and Baal Panchayats and Baal Sabhas, etc., in uh, different uh, schools and villages across the country. So it is, uh, and those have been uh, uh, touted as uh, uh, important spaces for children's participation. So uh, thereby, it would be important to probably evaluate the extent to which these, uh, you know, uh, uh, platforms have been able to uh, give children a stake and a say in decision making within these settings and how successful they have been. Again, uh, I think one thing which we really look at is, uh, uh, do children have respect uh, or do children's views find respect in the family setting? So this could be another area for research uh, attention. Uh, then, we can also look at uh, 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 undertaking studies of uh, children's policies, juvenile and justice laws and other statutory uh, frameworks and mechanisms which are set up for uh, protecting and promoting children's participation rights, uh, not in just India, but in various countries. And uh, it could also uh, be uh, interesting to have a comparative study of such provisions in different countries, particularly in, uh, in the backdrop of the condition of uh, children in those particular countries. So, in fact, uh, there is very little literature available in this area, and whatever is there are mostly uh, uh, small case studies uh, in such areas. So, uh, in depth systematic research could be uh, a very important uh, value addition. Again, uh, it could be important to uh, uh, evaluate the role of mass media in promoting and raising awareness about children's rights and particularly the right to uh, children's uh, participation. So uh, we know that the media is already under the scanner. There's already a lot of criticism about the role that media is playing, uh, but then structured systematic research would be important. And uh, also, as I've said, uh, over the decade, uh, last few decades, there have been uh, the emergence of many uh, 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 children's uh, media initiatives uh, in the alternative spaces which have uh, come up. Uh, uh, and not just children's media initiatives, but other child participation uh, initiatives too. And therefore, it's important to identify and document these various child participation initiatives uh, in India and in other parts of the world and evaluate the process and outcomes of children's participation in each of these initiatives. This would be important, not just for the sake of understanding uh, the measure of success or failure of these initiatives, but also uh, in understanding uh, what works and what does not. And uh, it would be valuable for uh, uh, different initiatives to learn from each other uh, through this kind of uh, research work. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, conclude my part of the deliberation here. And uh, uh, I don't know if I have uh, gone too fast, but uh, uh, that's it for now. And uh, I would definitely love to take uh, questions and comments. Thank you. OK, I think uh, I'll start off with the first question. Yes, indeed, uh, too much participation by children in digital media. And it is certainly 
a matter of concern. And uh, that is exactly where uh, uh, my concern lies in terms of the content that uh, is being produced for children. So, uh, uh, as I said, we do not, we only see children. Where children are uh, the target of a lot of commercial content and uh, that is happening through these cartoon shows and through gaming. But there is very little that we have to uh, have been doing to uh, uh, amplify or to hear what children have to say. I think uh, it is very important that the media practitioners start taking an active role in uh, understanding their own responsibility towards uh, children. And, uh, uh, and that is why I feel the uh, academicians also have a role to play in this because uh, if we can add more volume of research to this area and uh, we can uh, show how things are working, I think it will be a way to influence policy. It will be a way to influence the media policy in the country itself. And uh, that's how uh, we can change things. So uh, research attention in the area of children and media towards uh, production of content that is meaningful, content that is beneficial uh, to children is very important. At the same time, it is important to have children as co-creators, as active participants in, sh in shaping this content. And that is how we can really uh, take things in a positive direction. So uh, I hope I have answered the first question. And uh, second is uh, media is doing nothing to create awareness on uh, Foxo Act. Don't you think media should give their positive contribution in this field? Definitely. It's, it's a big, it's a big emphatic yes. Children, uh, media has a very important role to play and it is uh, tragic that media is not doing it. The media is not playing its role in creating awareness about, uh, about not just uh, POXO. It is not doing any role to create uh, awareness about children's rights. Uh, it is uh, doing very little to bring children's issues to the forefront of public attention. So in, uh, it is very important that uh, uh, as academicians, we uh, influence our uh, our own constituency, our our students, the media students, the budding media uh, practitioners, and uh, we mold them in a way to become more sensitive towards children, children's uh, needs and children's rights. That's a role that we have to play as academicians. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Anjuman. Thank you, Doctor Anjuman. Before we wrap up this session, I would request uh, Professor Sunil Kant Bhaira to have a light on the discussion of Dr. Anjuman Bora. Thank you, thank you, Parivav. And uh, I must congratulate Anjuman for this very lively uh, presentation. I always knew that uh, you are a good teacher and uh, you are very commanding and authoritative in your lectures. But today's lecture, particularly when you talked about children and media, uh, I think the focus of your talk, uh, if I refer to the first question, the focus of your talk was children from consumers to prosumers. Children not as consumers only, but children, if space has to be created, children need to be trained. Uh, to produce content. They need to be content creators. And when we, the title itself is children, media, and listening to the unheard voice. Unheard voice means the voice need not be in a societal or familial space, but we need a space for children's voice in the media itself. If not in mainstream media, but in alternative media spaces. That's the policy initiatives, you started with the UNCRC, the International, and then the National Commission of Protection of Child Rights, the national initiative that was very, very uh, structured. And thirdly, when you talked about the role of media, and you made a clear distinction between the mainstream media and the alternative media, where we can create spaces. 
and children's participation you have very rightly told that it is not to uh, um, um, the goal is not to seek liberty from the adults a children's participation in media is not to seek liberty it rather it is our duty our the adults duty to facilitate their participation and they are independent beings they have a clear thinking they can think independently so we need to create children as independent beings and we need to respect their thinking abilities as parents we must do it as teachers we must do it and as societal administrators also we need to create a space a very important aspect that is children uh, which is being uh, under consideration uh, by the international bodies as well as the national uh, bodies to give space to them no longer we treat children the way we were treating them i remember my uh, school days i used to get beaten up by my teachers if i am i haven't done homework today we can't think of such a thing so there is a paradigm shift as you talk theoretically in practice everything our way of looking at children so i am sure you will be able to uh, we will be able to create a space for children and i thank anjuman for leading the way and i know you are uh, researching in this area and your findings will certainly help the policy makers to uh, give space to the children thank you very much anjuman really you have added a feather to the tejpur university uh, it is an additional feather you made a brilliant presentation thank you anjuman. thank you sir thank, thank, you, thank you, you so sir. much thank you, thank you sir grateful for, for this your, opportunity thank you thank you sir for your nice observation so we are very thankful and grateful to dr anjuman bora uh, for her presentation and discussion during uh, this webinar series her series in third day i hope uh, the discussion of uh, dr anjuman is really helpful to all of our uh, media educators and the research scholars and the students at large so with these words again i thank dr anjuman bora for sparing some valuable time out of her busy schedule to join with us and uh, sharing some feedback so we are really grateful to you madam and mm -hmm. i also thankful to all of our participants for Hello. their long patience Hello. and joining with us joining with us and uh, uh, we are really am thankful to all the participants our host and my colleagues and friends who have joined and who have encouraged us to keep this webinar series ahead so my request to all the participants here we will wrap up this uh, part day session over here again we all will meet tomorrow at 11 o'clock so right now we will wrap up the, the series over here part day thank session you. thank you thank you